Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my assignment today is to share a few thoughts on the theme uprooting public sector and political corruption in Ghana, focusing on systems and mechanisms to effectively tackle the wastage of public resources, cataloged in various audit reports and breaches in our procurement policies, resulting in huge judgment deaths over the years. If we look at the subject matter of corruption in Ghana, has been one that has predated even our independence as a country. But cumulatively, uh, discussions around the subject matter have normally towed the political line, therefore disabling those who have the mandate to fight and investigate it, numbing those who should prosecute, and then also leaving those who should sanction those engaged in acts of corruption in this year. An unfortunate situation, but that is where we are as a country. Section 239 of the, ninth, of the Criminal Offenses Act, that's 1960, states, and I quote, a public officer or juror who commits corruption or willful oppression or extortion in respect of duties of office commits a misdemeanor. Two, says a person who corrupts any person in respect of duty as a public officer or juror commits a misdemeanor. So the fact that corruption is a crime is firmly established and rooted in law. Corruption is criminal, pure and simple, and Article 35A of the 1992 Constitution acknowledges this by providing that the state shall take steps to eradicate corruption and abuse of power. Therefore, incumbent on all well-meaning Ghanaians to lace up our boots to commit to the fight against this canker, which is a crime, and then stop lazing our various efforts with the politics we have done so far. According to Transparency International, corruption is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain, meaning everybody who is entrusted with a certain level of power, uh, who abuses it for their private gain, is engaging in an act of corruption. Unfortunately, we do not see some of these acts as corruption and therefore flagrantly abuse our power, flagrantly do it for our personal gain and for those of our cronies. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence of Ghana's fight against corruption per service, such as the Corruption Perception Index, the flagship uh, survey of the Transparency International, has since 2012, when the index became comparable, have not been very impressive. In fact, the fight against corruption per the CPI, which is a global measure of the fight against corruption on a global level. For Ghana, we have seen some zigzag scores, and I present some of them as follows. For instance, in 2020, Ghana scored 43 out of a clean score of 100 and ranked 75 out of 180 countries that made it into the CPI for 2020. A trend analysis of the CPI since 2012 indicates the best score thus far for Ghana was 48, which was gained in 2016. Since then, Ghana has been on a downward trajectory until 2018, when we started making progress, although not significant. Not significant because according to the CPI methodology, a significant progress in the score should be at least three numerical values up. And so if you 
scored 40 last year and you are scoring 41 this year, it means you have not made any significant progress. And last year, 2019, Ghana scored 41. And so if we have scored 43 in 2020, it means we didn't make any significant progress. And that is worrying. But then let me add that uh, Ghana has never made significant progress, as I've said. But if you look at the trend, and I made a graph, we, we would share this online later with the convenience so that you can have it. If you look at the graph in 2015, Ghana dropped. I bear in mind, I mentioned that in 2014, we scored 48, the highest so far. In 2015, we dropped by one, and so scoring 47. And then in 2016, somehow, we made a significant dip, four points from 47 to 43. Then again, in 2017, we dipped, scoring 40, 40 marks from the 43. So it means we have been on a downward trajectory and we continue to zigzag in the scores, which is not impressive at all. So it means that the significant dip that Ghana has experienced have been in the periods 2016 and then 2017, unfortunately. Other data also shows, if you look at the institutions, because we have a focus on institutions today, other data that the Transparency International and other institutions who work on the subject matter of corruption have churned out over the years, have also shown evidence clearly that in the front of institutions, the fight against corruption is not going that well. And again, I reference the Global Corruption Barometer, the 2019 version of the African Report. If you look at the first five institutions, all these were public institutions. So if you add the first six, except traditional authority, who came in for mention, which is very surprising, uh, you realize that the police, the judicial sector, public officials or the bureaucracy and the executive for that matter, we have parliament being cited, the office of the president and ministers of state, and then uh, the others then come in. So for the most important institutions, if you take first to three, these are public institutions and this is a worrying trend. And this shows that Ghana as a country needs to do more uh, when we are talking about the fight against corruption. And I would make some submissions to this as I progress. I would want us to look at some of the data around the causes of corruption. And it's interesting to note that as far back as 2004, when uh, the Global Integrity Report was produced, this is what it had to say about Ghana. Ghana's corruption problem has deep roots in society and our political culture, where societal expectations of largesse and patronage from holders of public office combined with a culture of official impunity, low remuneration, opacity, and unregulated discretion in the use of public authority to produce a system that is hospitable to corruption. Very unfortunate picture. That is in 2004. And if I ask you today, I dare say you might be saying or painting a similar picture. The causes of corruption are numerous and far reaching. Institutional weaknesses, poor ethical standards, including the limited commit commitment to values of integrity and self-discipline, skewed incentive structures, and insufficient enforcement of laws within the patrimonial society. And also, uh, in most of the instances, we talk about political context. Other factors implicated in the causes of corruption are attitudes and social circumstances that make average people disregard or circumvent the law in Ghana. This 
statement was made by uh, the NACAP document. According to the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan, which we refer to as the NACAP, and the NACAP is a 10-year framework that was facilitated by the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, a collective effort of all stakeholders to fight corruption and uproot it, just as the topic for today wants us to do. The NACAP is currently in its sixth year of implementation. And I am very sure that if I ask how many people have heard of the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan, many of us here would uh, perhaps say you have never heard of it. I remember recently, as part of the implementation process, myself and others here, duty from the GACC, uh, did some monitoring of the NACAP in the various MMBAs across Ghana. And the uh, findings are yet to be presented, but you would realize that even in institutions where they are supposed to budget for NACAP, many of the heads or administrative heads did not know what NACAP was about, unfortunately. A very fine blueprint adopted by Parliament to guide Ghana in the fight against corruption. I know that there is a shining example in here, the Judicial Service picked the NACAP document somewhere in 2017 or thereabout and carved out their actions and implemented. That is a good example of what we should all be doing. And I believe they deserve a hand of applause for such a laudable venture. Again, we, we, we continue to talk about issues around remuneration and uh, Professor Achuaye, uh, the, ven the venerable professor also cataloged some of the issues that constitute causes of corruption, and they are in sync with what the National Anti Corruption Action Plan provides, and also the OECD. Some issues around effects of corruption, and civil society has done very well in this regard to try to bring this to uh, the barest minimum for people to understand exactly what it is when we are talking about uh, issues around effects of corruption on the daily lives of the people. We say that corruption disproportionately affects the poor and takes away his livelihood for the middle class and those who are endowed, unfortunately. Again, we see the results of the benefits of corruption on the general populace uh, showing in the very bad roads we see on our roads, showcasing in the terrible construction works we see. I was telling some other group somewhere that uh, the schools we went to, fortunately today I celebrate my golden jubilee, and so today is a good platform for me. The schools we went to, the schools uh, that were built, dormitories and others, the old ones, if you look at them and compare them to what we see today, uh, you realize that corruption is actually affecting this country. We have roads being constructed and within three months when there are rains, the, uh, the, the surface or the tar is taken away. And these are the manifest effects that corruption has on us. We have people who do not know a hoot about construction. Uh, becoming contractors overnight. And so what you expect, we would get exactly what we get on our roads in the hospitals. We have poor people who go for health care, seeking services, and they would have to do away with the little money they have to ensure that they get these services. At the uh, detriment to their health, to the services that are supposed to be for them, for free, unfortunately. Ladies and gentlemen, focusing on corruption issues that have manifested through audits and procurement processes cannot be overemphasized. Various audit reports have painted an alarming picture of infractions committed annually, with some of these infractions recurring year after year. Although one may say that citizens' appreciation of this process 
may not be up to speed and as comprehensive as we would wish. For instance, uh, the general uh, knowledge out there is that there are infractions as to whether uh, misapplication or misappropriation, citizens know that they have been infractions. And so uh, we continue to hear that we do not appreciate the issues. And for that matter, we uh, discuss them from a very ignorant point of view. And, and that is not correct. We All we know is the fact that there are infractions. And so these infractions, which continue to be cited year after year after year, must be attended to by the Auditor General. And you realize from the 2019 report, some of the disastrous instances that were cited and the huge amounts that could have been gone, that could have gone into construction of school buildings, courts. Uh, recently, we, we went uh, to meet, have a meeting with the Chief Justice and we saw some of the beautiful courts that they are building around. Uh, the NCC, if you go to some of the districts in Ghana and see the offices they operate from, uh, the least said about them, the better. Shrag, which is the anti-corruption institution, which is supposed to be fighting corruption uh, for Ghana, leading that fight, uh, has uh, just about 100 offices out of the 200 and something office, uh, uh, districts in Ghana. How can we fight corruption if we are... Uh, not committed to the fight with uh, such lousy uh, budgets and such lousy logistics provided. The, the past or uh, immediate past Auditor General, or should I say the retired Auditor General, cites a lot of these infractions and he has mentioned year in, year out, both to in his reports and also in his uh, public briefings of some of the things that could be done to ensure that things change. And he has said clearly that he presents these findings to Parliament who are supposed to take action on them. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to tell you uh, uh, why some of the things around procurement happen uh, in this uh, story I picked somewhere of a public officer who wanted to procure some paint or to procure for the painting of a, uh, an office edifice. And uh, they asked for some quotations to be sent. Unfortunately, they received three quotations, all right. Uh, one of the quotations came from a Chinese, and the Chinese uh, quoted three million. And he spelled out clearly what exactly it was for he was going to use the money. And in each of them, he mentioned uh, when, uh, in the painting how much it would cost, how much the workmanship and others would cost, and then how much he would be making. Very well spelled out. Uh, an American national or businessman also put in a quotation, and he quoted seven million, outlining in his bid how he was going to uh, construct and do the renovations. Then finally, a Ghanaian also put in his bid and he quoted 10 million. And in the 10 million, he also clearly outlined exactly what it is he was going to do. Uh, at this point, the uh, minister at the justification hearings asked um, one on one what the Chinese was going to use the 3 million for, and he clearly said, uh, one million would go into procuring the paint. One million would go into getting people to do all the work. And then he would be making a profit as well out of that. The American also cited the same. And then when they asked the Ghanaian, so how is this 10 million going to uh, be put to use? Then he said, oh, Mr. Minister, the 10 million uh, out of it, 4 million is defense who is the minister, uh, three million is mine, and they will give the three million to the Chinese to ensure that the work is done. Yes, this, ladies and gentlemen, this could be seen going around as a joke, but this is our reality as a country. 
and I believe we all here assembled appreciate this. The question we should be asking ourselves since independence from 1957 to date is whether as a morally conscious society, any public officer with his thoughts would oversee any procurement that sees himself as a bidder and then after he has won such a contract, goes out there to sell it out with impunity. And uh, we all remember Manasseh Azure Awini's uh, contract for sale expose that resulted in some action being taken. That is a good example, and we want to see more of those happening. Unfortunately, the example that led to the action is a very bad example, which many public servants are engaging in as we speak. Chronicling the fight against corruption since independence, you would realize that each government has tried to do something rhetorically and also putting them into policy. And so we realized that in the 70s to the early 80s, Ghana resorted to using draconian measures to ensure that uh, people were prosecuted and those who were found to be culpable were dealt with. We also had the house cleaning exercises that happened uh, during uh, those times. And uh, even though they were very painful experiences, these are Ghana's experiences in the fight against corruption. However, uh, the Constitution of 1992 then uh, believed that we should do things differently. And so, Shride was purposely set up to ensure that we were fighting corruption effectively. Again, other institutions like the Audit Service, the Ghana Police Service, and others, FICs, and those who are constitutional creatures and also those who are created by uh, law uh, or frameworks, legislative frameworks, are present. And we continue to add on to them on a daily basis as to whether the addition of these laws has been effective in fighting corruption is for me and you to judge. Uh, we have had legislations, like I mentioned earlier, the Criminal Offenses Act, the Criminal Offenses and Other Procedures Act enacted in 1960. We have the contract uh, regime. We have the asset declaration regime, which in its present state, uh, the least said about the better. We have a whistleblower legislation that is supposed to promote whistleblowing. Uh, we have now an asset declaration regime an RTI law and a witness protection law to add on. Ideally, Ghana should be a shining example with all the things I have mentioned as do. Unfortunately, that is not the case. What then is the missing link between the existing frameworks and the reality? What can we do as a collective society interested in changing our ways to ensure that we fight corruption. I mentioned earlier that the NACAP is our blueprint. And in the NACAP, the strategy is prevention, is education, and then deterrence. And so we take it from that angle, those three. We prevent corruption, we ensure that we educate. And so from the educational angle, we are saying that even though people have heard of corruption, there remains, NCC recently, as, as uh, I think 2018, did an assessment and uh, they, they captured some issues, including the culture of gift giving and nepotistic tendencies, which are hampering the fight against corruption because people do not know that these factors constitute corrupt behavior or could lead to corrupt behavior. And so what can we do in the educational front is for public sector, private sector, civil society, and the media to continue to engage, empower, 
and ensure that citizens who see corruption would report it. If people are empowered, they would speak up. And I can cite some of the campaigns that have recently uh, garnered support and are uh, hot cakes burning. These are signs that when people have knowledge and they are empowered, they can do a lot. And I know that people are peeved. People want to see change. And if we do the education well, we will get people to understand the issues. On investigations, we have the institutions that are mandated to investigate. And so what do we do to get them to do their work well? We need to resource them and we need to allow them to do their work independently without fear of any reprisals, without fear of being let go. And I mentioned we were on the phone and some examples that we're giving, if you speak up, you are either transferred, if you speak up, you are either reassigned to a different schedule and the others. Those should be a thing of the past. We talk about prevention. Prevention of corruption is important because if we prevent it, the Auditor General will not have much to do. And that is a fact. If we prevent it, uh, nobody will be tempted to want to do the wrong in their various places of work. And so in preventing it, we are referencing acts that include resourcing the human resource sectors of the various institutions to produce, if they don't already have, procedures and regulations that address recruitment, promotions, and disciplining of staff. Complaint mechanisms, procurement, co uh, procurement codes of conduct, and ethical guidance, amongst others, should be dealt with. These are priorities that we believe every institution should have. And they shouldn't just have them, they should be practicalized and enforced so that administrative sanctions are applied. And then when it is elevated, we can then have the other processes being institutionalized. And in this regard, I made some points on the audit, which I, I believe when we share the document, we can be looking at because of time. The role of civil society and citizens in the fight against corruption has been widely spoken to. We need to do things like engaging and leading to ensure that there are synergies. We have too many different groups and we need to collaborate. We need to collaborate to ensure that there are no tear wars. And this is also for the public institutions to ensure that we are one for the other says, uh, if uh, we remove one broomstick, the, it's easy to break, but if they are together collectively, it's not easy to break. We believe that civil society can make inroads into the audit process, and we have done that with GSCC and other institutions, picking up the audit reports and uh, documenting some of the findings from them and making them comprehensible for the citizenry to understand. And working with social auditing groups, we have made some significant gains in the communities we work in. However, we do not have the resources to engage everybody, but public institutions are everywhere. And so with your support, we believe we can even do more. Civil society can also pick up the issues from the parliamentary level. And so when the recommendations are made, we all know that what happens is usually that the parliament makes its recommendations and sometimes these do not even see the uh, light of the day when they come to the floor of parliament because there are issues of politicking in there as well. And so it's for civil society to also pick up these reports and make them known so that everybody in Ghana is working collectively with the audit service, is working to promote procurement transparency is working to ensure that the issues around debarment in the procurement process are attended to, is working to ensure that we have e-procurement fully deployed. We are currently doing pilots. We want to see full deployment, taking away the human factor and ensuring that everything is done well. Uh, the gift miss is there, but then we believe that e-procurement will deal with the issues around procurement fraud and procurement um, uh, corruption. Uh, we, we know 
that if these are done, we would be making progress. In Parliament, we, we, we acknowledge that they have their uh, challenges, and we know that when issues go to the committee level, particularly with PAC, we realize that they need the capacity to ensure GIZ is doing some, but we believe that the state must resource them well. So that at the committee level, they will be able to act on the reports. Currently, I believe they are working on 2014 or so report of the Auditor General. If they expedite this and they, uh, their recommendations are current, then we are implementing from a current perspective and not from a past perspective where there is heckling on the floor to ensure that they hijack some of these processes. It is important to do so. Um, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to conclude with a quotation. Without strong watchdog institutions, impunity becomes a very, the very foundation upon which systems of corruption are built. And in, if impunity is not demolished, all efforts to bring to an end corruption is in vain. This was said by uh, Rigoberta Manchi, a Nobel laureate. I conclude by saying that it is for me and you, as the uh, patriotic song says, uh, say, it is for me and you to change Ghana. If we do not do our part, future generations would have uh, nothing to speak uh, that is good about us. As a man who said, "Yes, some Ghana here, and yes, sir, that's in Chima. We're very, very Thank you very much.